Well, thanks, Tom, for the introduction. And uh, I just want to note that this project is happening out of the Illinois River Biological Station, as I'm a student with the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And the project itself is funded through the Illinois Department Department of Natural Resources. Um, I'm a bit expired on this now, probably last time I can use this, but last year's fishing regulation information book had the flathead captures right on the cover, just highlighting the importance of these fish to the Illinois fishery. Uh, I'm gonna give some background first as the Rock River is kind of in the other section of the state. Uh, Rock River is a fairly big river system that starts up in Wisconsin and runs for about 318 miles in total, about 163 miles run in Illinois. It's about 10,500 square miles worth of drainage area in total, and about 3,500 of those are within Illinois. Uh, so it starts up there in Dodge County, Wisconsin, flows south, and then eventually southwestern, uh, southwesterly direction where it dips into the uh, Mississippi at the Rock Iron Line at the Quad City area. Looking at the Illinois section of the river more specifically, um, we have Rockford there as the big city that it goes through uh, first. My study reach of the river is a little bit smaller. It uh, starts at Sterling and Rock Falls and runs up to Dixon. It's about a 10 mile reach of the river system. Uh, why this project is even happening is a good thing to talk about. Back in June of 2009, there were multiple train cars that derailed near Cherry Valley, Illinois, which is a suburb in the southeasterly section of Rockford. Uh, and that's denoted by the red square there. About 60,000 gallons worth of ethanol uh, were dumped and subsequently flowed into the Rock River system. Uh, when this ethanol got into the Rock River system, um, the degradation of the ethanol used up oxygen, which eventually caused a massive fish kill. IDNR counted about 72,000 fish that were killed um, with around the Grand Detour area, which is kind of around here, as kind of where the start of a lot of flyhead catfish were noted being dead as well. Uh, Rockford, um, as a lot of large metropolitan areas, uh, um, kind of give interesting stochastic risk, uh, such as Rockford also having a super fun site where there's a lot of contaminated groundwater wells uh, right there beside the Rock River. Um, these nest structures, where they look like, they were placed as restoration efforts. But first, um, if you're unfamiliar with flathead catfish, they're similar to the other popular ictolurid species of North America in which they are cavity nesting species. So the male will find um, a place to nest, um, be it an undercut bank or maybe an aggregation of large woody debris um, or maybe even these nesting structures here. And so these, uh, the male will go into the nesting structure, entice a female to come in, the female will lay an egg patch and then he'll guard the nest for about seven days while the eggs incubate and then the fry will slowly disperse outside of that. Uh, and so these were placed within the Rock River in June of 2015. Uh, to talk a little bit more about that, um, here's the defined reach of the study section. So from Sterling and Rock Falls on the left up to Dixon up there on the right, we have three sets of where these nesting structures were placed. So we have the Rock Falls set down here in the, the most downstream section, five of them were placed there. In the middle of the reach, we have about 10 structures that were placed. Um, at right in front of the Sock Valley Community College. And then lastly, across from Page Park and Dixon, we had another five structures placed. And so a ton of structures were placed back in June of 2015. Uh, overall, we have some different objectives that we hope to cover with this project. So understanding how and um, when these fish might be using these nesting structures, um, using some techniques I'll talk about, uh, determining maybe if males get off multiple spawns in a year, um, is something that isn't understood in the literature and determining um, when these fish might be moving, might not be moving and some of the factors that go into that and maybe if they're moving outside the study reach and then also mapping the bottom of the river to understand the nesting structures and important habitat outside of that. Um, to talk a little bit about uh, one of the most visual aspects of this project. Uh, so radio telemetry was chosen instead of the more common acoustic telemetry nowadays as radio telemetry provides signal but even when you don't have direct line, so, line of sight of the tag. And so since these fish um, commonly associate with some sort of structure, uh, we wanted to be able to pick them up without necessarily getting the receiver right in front of their face as what might have to happen with acoustic tags. Anyhow, these uh, tags put out a signal about every five seconds. And if you take the life in days, that's about eight years. So potential uh, for someone to come in after me to do stuff with these tagged fish. Um, talking more about the tagging, 
Uh, we had plans last fall to tag about 265 fish. Uh, sounds probably a little crazy to some of you. Um, and then a minimum size being about 500 millimeters. And the literature, it's noted that about 470 is when most fish become mature. So 500 millimeters just doubly ensures that. But we actually got done in five days worth of tagging, which is crazy, um, I think, and awesome. We got about 225 fish tagged. Um, there's just some summary stats there uh, across the fish that we tagged. And there's the biggest fish that Elizabeth is holding in a picture below, which is uh, everyone was excited to see the big 50 pound flathead out of the river system. Uh, going back to these project objectives, I wanted to talk a little bit more about this fourth objective today. Uh, some people may be familiar with side scan and others may not be. I just want to give a little intro to it if you're unfamiliar. Uh, I like to describe side scan as you're flying across the top of the river bottom and you're shining a really bright light to kind of take a scanned image. And so your boat is here and both of these little diagrams that they put out by Hummingbird. Uh, and so you're going across the top of the water to create these highly detailed images of the bottom in which that middle section, which is mostly blank, represents the depth of the water column. Uh, most of the software I use takes out that water column um, section to kind of make it a little bit easier to interpret. Here's just another example of that, um, like that 2D image, but just fold it up to note, show you how that water column is actually represented. I'm gonna show you a few images now of what I've actually seen across the Rock River. Uh, what's somewhat common is this uh, riprap or some rock revetment wall that I'm sure you've seen before. It might provide some good uh, crevices for flathead catfish to hang out in. Uh, just highlighting the high detail that you can see with this new side scan is these uh, steel retaining walls. You can see it going back and forth there. And what's really common with a lot of these fancy houses are these um, smooth and thick concrete walls. You can eat, if someone has steps in there, you can even see the steps going down. What we see in the middle of the river section is um, important too. And these large expanses where you have a lot of sand, uh, just like in a desert with sand dunes blown by wind, uh, the water flow also creates sand dunes, which is cool to see. Uh, hence the name Rock River, you also have some rock in there. Uh, and on the left side of this image, you have a giant rock shelf, and that's why there's a big shadow and uh, blank space of the data there. But on the right-hand side, it's breaking up a little bit and provides more cobbly uh, rocks there. What might be really important, as I mentioned earlier, are some large weight debris aggregations outside the nesting structures, uh, somewhat common along the Rock River section uh, that I'm looking at. All right, so uh, here's what you guys probably really wanna see. Um, and these are the nesting structures. Uh, these little houses here are waypoints that were taken by the IDNR when they placed the structures in June of 2015. And here, I'm just gonna highlight where they actually are. This is that Sock Valley Community College set where we had 10 structures placed in the middle of the reach. Uh, this might not be too informative, so let's zoom in and give a closer look. Uh, side scan imaging, uh, sometimes the shadow uh, tells you more about the object itself rather than the sonar image bouncing off the object. So the lack of data actually gives you data, if that makes sense. Uh, anyhow, these nest structures provide a unique shape in which they have this rounded top with a squared off base. And with that, you get a unique shadow that allows us to tell and see where these nesting structures are. Um, I've heard that we got about 17 or 18 of these structures left out of the original 20 that were placed, and that was good to know since the Rock River does get some pretty high flows in the springtime. About a minute, Spencer. Okay. Um, doing some stuff with the pan -op optics live scope in the near future. It's live scanning sonar. Uh, pretty interesting to use. Uh, I encourage you to look it up if you don't know about it. Uh, with this, I can take these side scan mosaics, put them back onto the fish finder so I can understand what habitat these fish are using in the future. Um, when I'm actively tracking these fish this summer and next. Outside of that, you can kind of create these cool polygon maps showing the distribution of your different habitat types across the bottom of your um, study area, and also create some 3D bathymetry maps as I'm also taking down scanning sonar um, data while I've been doing these side scan mosaics. Um, with that, there's my email, and there's also Jim's email and phone number if you'd like to call me about any questions.